Week before last, workers at Amazon's JFK 8 Fulfillment Center in Staten Island, New York, made history, voting to join the Amazon Labor Union, the ALU. As a result of that vote, JFK 8 became the first unionized Amazon warehouse in the United States. Following the vote, Brima Silla, one of the lead organizers of the unionization effort, was interviewed by Jacobin and had this to say about why he chose to get involved with the union. Living in New York, I know that unions are powerful tools to protect the interests of their members. Look at the subway workers in the MTA, firefighters from the FDNY, sanitation workers, and even the police in the NYPD. Sharp-eyed readers may have noticed all those union Scylla lists as inspirations have something in common. Subway workers, sanitation workers, firefighters, cops... Those are all public sector unions, meaning they represent workers who are employed not by private companies, but by agencies of the government, in this case the government of New York City. In the United States, half of all union workers belong to public sector unions, around 7 million people in 2021, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. While the total number of members are about the same between public and private sector unions, the rate of unionization among public sector workers is more than five times higher, 34% compared to 6% of private sector workers. Numbers like that, combined with how essential many of the jobs done by these workers are or are perceived to be, have made public sector unions some of the most powerful organized labor groups in the country. But the size and influence of public sector unions is a relatively recent phenomenon. Prior to the 1960s, the only category of public sector employees with significant rates of unionization were postal workers. Other public sector unions, such as teachers' unions, existed, but few workers chose to join them. And the efforts of public sector unions to organize and represent their members were severely limited by both state and federal laws. While organized labor in general saw its influence greatly increase during the Great Depression and the years following World War II, public employees were mostly left out. President Franklin Roosevelt himself spoke out strongly against the rights of government employees to organize, writing in a letter in 1937, Upon employees in the federal service rests the obligation to serve the whole people, whose interests and welfare require orderliness and continuity in the conduct of government activities. This obligation is paramount. Since their own services have to do with the functioning of the government, a strike of public employees manifests nothing less than an intent on their part to prevent or obstruct the operations of government until their demands are satisfied. Such action, looking toward the paralysis of government by those who have sworn to support it, is unthinkable and intolerable. And people accused him of being a commie. Some commie. Thanks, Franklin. Things started to change in the late 50s. In 1958, New York City Mayor Robert Wagner Jr. issued an executive order giving city employees collective bargaining rights. In 1959, the state of Wisconsin passed legislation extending collective bargaining rights to its public employees. And in 1962, President Kennedy issued an executive order granting the same rights to federal employees. In the decades that followed, as private sector union membership decreased due to a combination of the decline of heavily unionized industries and relentless attacks on organized labor from conservatives, particularly at the state level, membership in public sector unions steadily grew, bringing us to the present state of affairs, where public sector unions enjoy a roughly equal number of members and a far higher rate of membership compared to private sector unions. Of course, the fact that they fared better than private sector unions over the last 50 or 60 years doesn't mean public sector unions have had it easy. Staunch, almost pathological opposition to organized labor has been one of the most commonly shared attributes among American conservatives since the labor movement began in the mid-19th century. 
And since the largest and most powerful unions these days are public sector unions, they are frequently the targets of the harshest attacks. As membership in public sector unions has grown over the last few decades, so have conservative efforts to hinder and vilify them, seeking to blame the pensions and other benefits won for government employees by their unions for the budget shortages faced by many states in recent years. The best that can be said about this is, at least it's ideologically coherent. If private sector unions are bad for cutting into the profits of their companies, it follows that public sector unions are even worse because their benefits come ultimately at the cost of the taxpayers. Conservatives love to push the narrative that we, the taxpayers, are being taken advantage of by a bloated, inefficient government, and a crucial element of that narrative is the stereotypical, lazy, overpaid state employee who does little work yet enjoys generous benefits and impervious job security thanks to their powerful union. However, there is one exception to the conservative opposition to organized labor. There is one union, or rather one type of union, that has escaped the ire of Republicans, right-wing libertarians, neo-fascists, oops, I said Republicans already, and it's a kind of public sector union, which is even weirder. Weirder still, this union isn't just ignored or tolerated by conservatives, it's one of their most influential and protected special interest groups. Of course, I'm talking about police unions. Police in the United States began forming fraternal organizations and labor unions to represent their interests in the late 19th century, but police unions as we know them today didn't really emerge until the 1950s and 60s. In the early decades of the 20th century, police efforts to organize were met with the same kinds of resistance faced by other public employees. How could the police be trusted with the responsibility to enforce the law and keep the peace if they also had the power to walk off the job if their demands to the government agencies which employed them weren't met? It was actually a police strike in 1919 that was largely responsible for the popular antipathy toward public sector unions that lasted until the latter half of the century. Cops in Boston walked off the job en masse, demanding official recognition of their union as well as higher wages and improved working conditions. Several days of Violence and looting followed, leading to Massachusetts Governor Calvin Coolidge sending in the Massachusetts State Guard to restore order and take control of the police department. Most of the striking cops were fired and replaced by new recruits. I find this entire episode to be quintessentially American in all the worst, saddest ways. One of the few times when a major city's deeply problematic, institutionally flawed police department has essentially been abolished and rebuilt from the ground up. And what was the problem being solved? Workers striking for better pay and conditions. The governor sent in the troops to break a strike, and the strikers, having their heads cracked, were cops who would ordinarily be the ones called on to crack the heads of striking workers. God bless America, I guess. The post-war growth of police unions was driven primarily by two factors. The first factor was the aforementioned changes in federal and state laws that broadened collective bargaining rights. The second factor was resistance within police departments to external pressures for reform. And those two factors are not independent of each other. Once police unions gained the right to collectively bargain, they began to use the power and influence that came with that right to block reforms. Case in point, the Police Benevolent Association of the City of New York, the NYC PBA, or just the PBA, Today, it's the largest police union in New York City. It's also one of the oldest organizations of its kind, having been founded in 1892. In 1966, after decades of complaints about corruption, racism, and police brutality, Mayor John Lindsay appointed four civilians to the city's Civilian Complaint Review Board, the CCRB. The PBA didn't like that one bit. 
The president of the PBA, John Cassis, said, I'm sick and tired of giving in to minority groups with their whims and their gripes and shouting. The PBA collected enough signatures to force a public vote on the issue of civilians on the review board, which they won. It would be 20 years before civilians were finally allowed back on the CCRB, and then only with police oversight. Eventually, in the 1990s, the CCRB was restructured into an all-civilian body, but that only came after years of persistent, sometimes violent protests from New York City cops supported by their unions. And even today, while New York City CCRB is the largest independent police oversight agency in the country, it has no actual authority to discipline the officers it investigates. It can only make recommendations to the police department. The PBA's determined resistance to the establishment of an independent review board is similar to battles that have taken place between police unions, city governments, and civilian activists in cities across the United States throughout the 20th and into the 21st century. These battles all have a pronounced us versus them character. Police departments represented by their unions tend to respond to calls for reform by closing ranks and playing victim, complaining about how unappreciated they feel and of how difficult it would be to do their jobs if forced to abide by the new rules, whatever those new rules might be. This us-versus-them attitude comes into play when we examine the difference between what police unions claim they're doing and what they're actually doing. Let's stick with the NYC PBA as our example. According to its website, quote, The NYC PBA is a labor union that seeks to protect and advance its members' rights and interests. Among other things, it negotiates their contract, which establishes compensation, benefits, and working conditions, ensures fair treatment by the city and the NYPD, provides legal services and representation, and administers their health and welfare benefits. The PBA also encourages legislation that helps its members and improves their families' lives, while it opposes legislation detrimental to them." Unquote. That sounds good, right? Negotiating contracts, ensuring fair treatment, representing the interests of its members, that's what a labor union is for. But look at how the current president of the NYC PBA, Pat Lynch, responded to recent recommendations for police reform by the New York State Attorney General's office. After complaints of misconduct by officers of the NYPD from protesters and community organizers in the days following the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, the New York AG released a report containing several suggested reforms, including strengthening the CCRB by giving it final disciplinary authority over the police department, making body camera footage publicly available online, and creating a new independent commission with the power to hire and fire NYPD leadership and approve the department's budget. PBA President Lynch's response, quote, If the goal is to heal the rift between police officers and the public, that won't be achieved without giving meaningful consideration to the perspective of police officers on the street. However, the best way to heal the rift between police officers and the public would be for police officers to stop killing and brutalizing members of the public and especially getting away with it. That's just me. Ask yourself why any good cop or any organization that represents the interests of good cops would have a problem with increased transparency, accountability, or civilian oversight. But see, that's the problem right there. The PBA and police unions in general don't represent the interests of the good cops. They don't draw a distinction between good cops and bad cops. As a result, they tend to view any attempt to get rid of bad cops as an attack on all cops. From their perspective, it's cops versus the world. That insularity doesn't just estrange cops from civilians. It also separates most police unions from the broader organized labor movement. According to the book, 
Law Enforcement, Police Unions, and the Future by Ron DeLord and Ron York, between 80 and 85 percent of all police unions are unaffiliated with other organized labor groups. The largest police unions that are a part of organized labor are the International Union of Police Associations and the International Brotherhood of Police Officers, which are affiliated with the AFL-CIO and the SEIU, respectively. Though, since the George Floyd protests began, there have been calls from other affiliated unions to expel police unions from the organized labor movement entirely. The mutual enmity that seems to exist between organized labor and police unions is understandable if you know the history that exists between the two. Strike-breaking and preventing workers from organizing were among the most important duties of police officers in many American cities in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In fact, According to The History of Policing in the United States by Dr. Gary Potter, opposition to organized labor spurred the development of police technology and tactics that we take for granted today, such as call boxes, regular patrols, even longer night sticks. Union busting helped to shape modern policing in the United States in a very significant way. When you consider that alongside the fact that early efforts by police officers to unionize, collectively bargain, and strike for their rights were swiftly thwarted by government officials and used to justify legislation that banned all public sector employees from organizing for decades, it kind of makes sense that police unions and organized labor seem to hate each other so much. Now, I'm not trying to argue that police unions are the only unions that can go bad or shield their members or their leaders from consequences of criminal behavior. Since the very beginning of the labor movement, it has been tangled up with organized crime and political corruption, all manner of unsavory things. I'm a big supporter of unions. I think organized labor is the most effective tool that workers have to protect their rights and further their interests. But it's not perfect. It has problems. All labor unions are not the same, and they don't all put the good of their members first as often as they should. However, having said that, I still think it's instructive to compare how police unions operate with other types of labor unions. And since police unions are the favorite form of organized labor of conservatives, it's only fitting to compare them to conservatives' least favorite form of organized labor, teachers' unions. The largest teachers' union, in fact, the largest labor union, period, in the United States, is the NEA, the National Education Association. The NEA was founded in 1857 as the National Teachers Association, then renamed in 1870 when it merged with several other groups. Today, the NEA includes over 2 million members, and it acts to protect the interests of those members, just as the PBA acts to protect the interests of the cops it represents. For example, the NEA fights for higher wages for teachers. It fights to increase federal funding for public education. It opposes measures like school vouchers, which would siphon funding away from public schools into private ones. During the COVID-19 pandemic, it has fought to protect the health and safety of teachers, pushed for protections necessary to create the safest work environment possible. But unlike the PBA and other police unions, teachers unions like the NEA have also historically advocated for the rights and well-being of the people for whom their members are responsible, their students. Following the end of the Civil War, the president of the National Teachers Association suggested that states in the former Confederacy should be required to provide free public education to black students as well as whites as a condition of readmittance to the Union. In the 1910s, the NEA endorsed women's suffrage. In the 1940s, it supported the passage of the GI Bill, which enabled millions of military veterans to get an education. In the 1960s, it supported the Civil Rights Movement and lobbied in favor of landmark legislation like the Civil Rights Act of 1964. 
Today, if you go to the legislative action section of the NEA's website, you'll see far more advocacy on behalf of students than teachers. You'll see links to pages dedicated to increasing access to technical education, child nutrition, gun violence prevention, affordable access to higher education, access to special education for students with disabilities, support for schools in rural communities, LGBTQ rights, racial justice, voting rights, workers' rights, women's rights, even police reform. In other words, while it does protect the best interests of teachers, the country's largest teachers' union also seeks to protect the best interests of the students those teachers have dedicated their lives to educating, and seeks to use its platform and resources to advocate for policies and reforms that would benefit everyone. Teachers, students, parents, and all of us. The NEA has not been perfect throughout its history, and it's not perfect now, nor are teachers' unions in general, nor are public sector unions in general, nor is the organized labor movement as a whole. It's an imperfect attempt to respond to problems that are deeply rooted in our culture and which often don't have simple solutions. But I do think the differences between an organization like the NEA and an organization like the PBA in terms of goals, methods, and how they influence and seek to influence our broader society are striking. Police unions as they currently exist are both products of and keepers of the broken, destructive system of policing we have in the United States. Any successful effort to reform, restructure, or rebuild police departments will have to include police unions in that reform. They can no longer exist to protect cops from the consequences of their actions. They must become organizations that not only allow cops to collectively bargain for fair wages and conditions and protect their rights as employees, but that also act in the interests of both cops and the general population by helping to ensure that their members are actually doing the job they were theoretically hired to do. Protect and serve the public. Some proponents of police reform favor doing away with police unions altogether, depriving cops of the right to organize and collectively bargain. I don't think that's the right thing to do. I get why that's an appealing option, given the horrendous state of policing in the country, but if we are someday able to implement a reimagined concept of policing to make individual cops and police departments part of and accountable to their communities, and that's a big if, I'll grant you, then the government employees who work for those police departments deserve the same right to organize and fight for their interests as everyone else. Because... All workers deserve that right. When Franklin Roosevelt wrote that government employees shouldn't have the ability to strike because of their obligation to the public, he missed half the picture. If the government of a democratic nation is meant to represent the interests and welfare of the people, then that obligation extends to all of us, including those of us who work for the government. Earlier in that 1937 letter from which I quoted previously, Roosevelt writes that for government workers, the employer is the whole people. He's right about that. But isn't the organized labor movement itself founded on the idea that obligations between a worker and an employer should not run in one direction only? Just as a worker owes something to the boss, the boss owes something to the worker. When people choose to work for the government, they assume certain responsibilities for the people for whom that government stands, for us. But that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility we have to them. 